So, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce Greg Wallace. Greg Wallace is a writer, a media personality, a former greengrocer, a <laughs> fitness guru. Hey. He's probably best known for presenting and judging MasterChef. Welcome to Glasgow, Mr. Wallace. How are you? Gary, it's great to see you. Stop calling me. You didn't even call me Mr. Wallace when you were on MasterChef, mate. So Listen, you, me, you don't worry, no one called you uh, on MasterChef, to be fair. <laughs> so call me, call me great, but that's very, very kind of you. Thank you very much for the pleasure. Absolutely. How have pleasure, you been? Gary. Anytime. You're looking good? Anytime. Yeah, fit, fit and well. Um, luckily, we've been able to do some filming. You know, um, television people are seen as key workers, I think. Really? Because I, I, think I totally the, the, agree. The government, in their wisdom, want television to continue. So we've been able to film MasterChef. We just haven't been able to do anything on location. Everything's been in the in the studio, but we've yeah. we've carried on. In the first lockdown, um, I'm a I'm a bit of a workaholic, as you know, and I got a bit panicky because mm -hmm. I couldn't I couldn't work. And then once I settled down, I really really enjoyed it. I, I've got the, I cook for the family every day. We've got five adults here and a baby. I, I did all the yeah. shopping. I cooked lunch for the family every day. I went for walks. I just really enjoyed it. I, I um, remember you were really busy on Instagram. You know, two or three live videos a day on Instagram. And again, it was just nice to, I think for all of us during this, particularly that first lockdown, I think just getting that little escape into someone else's world. And I don't know about you, but I quite like looking at, looking behind the celebrity and seeing their, how good their kitchen is and if my kitchen's better than theirs. And, is you know, that, that right? Being, I, I think everybody, you know, when you're watching the news, you're reading the bookshelves of what the, what people are reading and that sort of thing. So we've well, kind of escaped into other people's lives uh, through, have, through I mean, the means of this. I mean, I'm heading towards 60, so social media is a real phenomenon for me and I've had to, I've had to learn to use it because so much of, of what we do these days is social media and if you want to get involved in uh, as as somebody on the television if you want to get involved in any campaigns uh any any sort of um advertising of stuff for, for products or brands or services they want to know what your you, you, social you, media you, yeah, they, is. they need to know but you're very good at it you're at your you know you're you're very good i, I sometimes again back at that first lockdown you know everybody's trying to keep busy and keep a profile I felt lazy every time I looked on Instagram, seeing how much you were doing. You know, I'm, I was quite happy to get a recipe out a day, or, but you were you were really bringing people into your into your life and yeah, and showing well, people I, there was a bit of fun. I, I've got loads of energy. I wasn't used to being at home. I was just used to working all the time, and so that was the only outlet open to me. So yeah, that's what I did. I'd kind of wake up in the morning and start chatting on Instagram while I was still in bed with the, the baby asleep beside me and stuff, and then. And then cook during the day, and then film the family going for 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 Watson, a walk. Yeah, but no, uh, amazing. But, but the following started growing, so everybody must have uh, must have enjoyed it. I went into lockdown, I think, with forty five thousand followers, and came out with one hundred and twenty. Wow. So obviously, everybody everybody enjoyed it. Enjoyed what it was, but it was just really natural, and I think it it certainly fitted the time. You know, there was no message, and there was no. It was just like. Here, this is what I'm up to. I'm checking in. How is everyone? And you know, it was it was really nice to see. It was really good to see. Marcus uh, Waring phoned me up during the middle of the lockdown. Obviously, you know Marcus very well. And uh, he said to me, "Mate, I'm really enjoying your cookery videos. It was yeah. the nicest phone call I got." He went, "You're not a chef," he said, "and that's quite refreshing because you don't talk like a chef. Yeah. You just talk like someone cooking at home." And he said, "No." Yeah. I he said, Greg, forgive me. He said, I had no idea you actually did so much cooking at home. <laughs> but he said, I'm really yeah. enjoying the videos. I said, thanks very much. But you sometimes get called a chef, don't you, in the press? All the time, you know, they, yeah. They, and they I'm call not. you an ex-chef and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not. And then on the other hand, I get people often say to me, what are you doing as a judge on MasterChef if you're not a chef? How can you yeah. judge people if you're, if you're not a chef? I think the times... After this year's professional master, and I half a page saying, "What is the point of Greg Wallace on MasterChef?" So I've been I've been coping with that as well since MasterChef started. I was um, I'm, I'm always very conscious of that. I'm always very conscious of that when I, you know when I first came out when it first came out that I won, and they would also always ask you who your favourite you know judge was. Is it Marcus or Monica? And I said, "Well." There's three judges and my favourite is Greg. <laughs> you know, just get it, get it, you know, so... Um, yeah, they don't, they don't. I, can, I think I can answer the question, why you're the judge on MasterChef? Go you know, on, and, I, and again, I often say that the 
the whole the whole experience because some of the episodes you're not in and people don't realize that but when you're filming and you're not there it's noticed it's a completely different sh- it's a completely different atmosphere within within the studio and I always felt that you were the you were there as a kind of to stop people jumping out the window afterwards okay. yeah I think uh, I bring a lighter feel to it what people yeah, don't definitely. see what what people don't see is how much interaction I have with you guys the contestants yeah and uh, it's always your, your terrible jokes I remember yeah yeah but, I don't think people realise that you know the cameras have to be on you and you have to talk to us yeah. So if you can be a little bit more relaxed, we can get more conversation from you. And yeah, that yeah. is what the, you know, the, the television is a cookery competition, but you're not learning about food as a viewer. You're learning about the people. So you need the people to talk. To, to also, to talk, I think yeah. the BBC in their wisdom, they want me on there so that I taste the food the same way as the viewers would, because you're yeah. going to get a completely different response from me with Marcus and Monica, as good as it is, they're unlikely to break into a smile and they will give you a rundown <laughs> on how technically yeah. good it is. Then you've yeah. got me, like someone at home, who just puts, Gary, puts your food in his mouth and just it simply goes, oh, mate. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, and that's exactly the same way as a viewer would taste. So I yeah. think that's why they, they have me Cause up there. Because I, I always thought, again, when you're filming and you take your food up, it's a terrifying experience. You put your plate down and you know yourself as a chef where you've went wrong and, and what the judges might say. And Marcus was always um, pretty tough. And then it would, it, would, it would go to Monica. And Monica, if Marcus had missed something, she would definitely find it, particularly with things like pastry she, or technique. And she always talk, spoke about technique. It always spotted when it wasn't 100%. But with you, we never had a clue what you would say. There was no clue in what direction you were going to take your critique. So it was... Uh, can, I t- it was- can I tell you the, the, the best compliment I got before Marcus, obviously, we had Michelle Rue Jr. But Michelle Rue Jr. turned around to the rest of the chefs and said, honestly... He said, do you know who you need to impress? He said, you need to impress Greg. He said, we are chefs and we cook our food for customers. And Greg is the most knowledgeable customer I've ever come across. He eats in like every single decent restaurant around the country. If you can't please him, you shouldn't be here. I almost gave him a hug. I was like, <laughs> but there won't be a there won't be a master chef judge anywhere in the world who has tasted more master chef food than you. Than me. I'm the only one who does all three. I know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, but also, I do so much telly. Remember, you're aware, obviously, you've been on it, but for everybody else, MasterChef is a premier cookery competition, the premier cookery competition, the professional one that you rightly won, all hands down, uh, hands down, not all hands down, hands down that you won, um, is incredible food. But foremost, it's a television program. Now, it might seem to everybody that what I do is relatively easy, and it is for me because I know it. But you must have people there who understand how television works. Yeah, TV is not easy. I, I mean, I've done, I've, done a lot of TV, yeah. I've done a lot of TV since and presenting, and it's the hardest thing I've ever done. MasterChef well, was easy in comparison because you just really? be yourself. Oh, Fascinating. See, see, well, trying I, to, see, trying to present, it's the it's a, toughest it's a, it's thing It's a technical job, isn't it, and a oh. skillful job. But the more, I think yeah. it's like watching a, a, a footballer play. Like, you know, the, 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 the better they are, the more talented they are, the easier it looks. So yeah. I'll give you another example of it. And, and so I think because I lark around and I'm obviously, I'm obviously a working class man with a common touch, I think I must make it look like I'm doing very little. But if you try to do the TV <laughs> show, you'd understand. But I once yeah. stood beside the great, and we've now lost him, the lovely, lovely Michelle Rue. Not Michelle Rue Jr., my mate. But yeah, Michelle yeah. Rue, the, the founder of the, yeah. the Walter Side Inn, founder of, uh, of the Gavroche with his, with his brother, um, Albert. And I stood beside him once because he was predominantly a pastry chef and watched him take a knife out of his pocket. He's had since he was 14 years old with his initials burnt into it. And he carved a pear, right? And he carved it with the hat still on it. You know, like the pixie hat with the points. And the, And I yeah. looked at him do it and it was really, and I thought, well, yeah, that's easy. Do you know that once you know how, and look how well presented that is. I'll do that when I go home. Two kilos of pears, Gary. Not one. Not one not done. Not one did I manage to do. Yeah. And I, I think 
the better you are at something, the easier it looks to everybody else. That's it. Like, I've just compared myself to you, to Michelle Rue. In a minute, <laughs> I'll be picking on people and, and, and top fo- footballers. My ego knows no bounds, does it? Forgive me. <laughs> so, I mean, you've been doing MasterChef since 2005. Did you ever think that in 2021, the show would still be, in fact, the show is bigger than it's ever been? No, a professional master chef this year went on to BBC One from BBC Two. That all three yeah. series started on BBC Two, amateur celebrity pros, and now it's all on BBC One. And the viewing figures are bigger than ever. In yeah. o- honestly, honest, honest answer, it's been the biggest impact on my life. It's like, it's made me, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah. There you go. It's made us famous. It's huge. It's you know, it's, huge. It's, it's it's it completely picked me up twisted me around and stuck me back down somewhere somewhere else it, it's it's just been an absolute phenomenon yeah no it's incredible and it's it's worldwide as well i mean master chef professionals the, the the one that you film is in over 100 countries and it just repeats for years i still get messages every day from people congratulating me on winning it that have just seen it in israel or just seen it in the way or something like that. I mean, it's incredible. I've got a story like this, right? I was filmed, I've done an ITV series that's finished now, and it was Greg Wallace in South Africa, right? I'm in Soweto, which is a shanty town the size of Manchester, right? And I'm smack bang in the middle of it with a tuk-tuk driver, film crews and armed guards, right? Because it can be it can be a hairy place. And there's this shack with chicken wire all over it, concrete shack. And it does these things called fat cooks, which are like savoury donuts, right? And the guy's taking me there to meet a couple of his mates. This is this is this is the Soweto shanty town outside of Johannesburg with a t- local tuk tuk driver, right? And there's a lady, African lady, black African lady. She's making these donuts. She looked over her shoulder, looked over her shoulder again, and I thought it was the camera crew. And she came up to the wire. She went, "What are you doing here?" I went, "Well, we're filming." And she went, "No, you. What are you doing?" I was like, "What?" What? She went. You're Master Chef. I've been watching this for ten years. <laughs> what are you doing in Soweto at my donut hut? Honestly, it was I, the most I, incredible meeting I've had. I've been recognised in Fifth Avenue, New York. Wow! People tugging on you, going, oh, "Can't believe you're here." But I, I was in uh, I was in the Shetland Islands filming. I was up filming uh, uh, the the fish coming in and the the, the mussel farms and stuff like that. And it was right in the middle of summer, so there was no night time, so we were filming at midnight. So we arrived quite late. We went to the, the restaurant. It's about half nine at night, and I was sitting there with the kind of crew and stuff like that. I was about four or five of us around the table, and one of the waiting staff kept looking over. So the, the crew called over and says, look, it's fine. You can get your, your picture. It's fine. So I'm standing there get, getting my picture taken with this girl, and she says to me, I can't believe that I've met the judge of MasterChef. She thought I was you. No way. <laughs> yeah, true. That's a true story. She thought I was Greg Wallace, and I never told her otherwise. So I'll tell you a story, right? I got into a London taxi one day. I had to go to Heathrow Airport, and I didn't want to chat. Sometimes you don't want to chat. And London cab drivers chat to me. So I put my collar up, I had a cap on, and I put the newspaper in front of my face, and I said, Heathrow, please, driver. And there I sat, and he left me alone. As we get towards the airport, I've now got the newspaper in my lap. And I saw him looking in his rear view mirror at me. And he looked over his shoulder at me. He went, come on, mate, give me a clue. I said, I'll work on the television. I said, I'll, I'll do food television. I said, I'm, look, I'm the, I'm the judge of MasterChef. In fact, I'm the only judge of all three MasterChefs. I said, did you know, actually, I was the first ever presenter of Saturday Kitchen. He said, no, I know who you are, mate. What bloody terminal do you want? <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Have you go. ever had to pull out the card? Do you know who I am? No. The parking space or anything? No. No, no. I never, never Look, I've got I've got a PA, Helen, who set this up. Oh, she's brilliant. I, I, I can't ever phone a restaurant or a hotel or a rugby club and say, listen, I'm Greg Wallace off the television, and can you make sure that I get a good time? <laughs> but my PA can. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my PA, my PA, because I love my rugby, as you know, my PA will contact rugby clubs and go, I'm PA to Greg Wallace off the television. He's he's coming up. He wants to come up and watch the game. Can I inquire as to what corporate facilities you may have? And I often get a free invitation. Amazing. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so just, just jumping on to MasterChef Pros. So you might not be aware, but the, the culinary education uses MasterChef Pros as almost like a teaching tool. 
Wow. So it does, particularly the, the skills tests, which I think is the best telly ever. Uh, and again, a lot of the, the guys on this call just now probably agree. And those, obviously, you bill it as these kind of fundamental tasks that every chef should know. You line up the you line up the contestant. You know they're standing with the hero shots outside the Georgian mansion, two rosette restaurant and stuff. And then you put them into that skills test and give them a bit of fish or a chicken, and they can't do it. It's great for us as educators because the students come back in the following morning. And they talk about so-and-so head chef that can't prep a chicken or cut a bit of, bit of fish. And what it does for us is it, it, it reinforces the reason why they should go to college and why they should get that the fundamentals done properly. Um, so it's a great, and it's, it's probably the reason I ended up on the show was because we did talk about it so often and, and we did talk about, and then the students are telling me, well, if, you know, if you're so smart, you go do it. Um, so, so thankfully, but do, do you remember my skills test? You no, I was not. just going to ask you, Gary, what it, it was yours? It was a neck of lamb sandwich and I undercooked it. And you you spent most most of the critique buying, buying like a sheep. Bah. And all I, kept, all I kept thinking about, you're standing there doing the skills test, all I kept thinking about was walking through the city of Glasgow College with all the students going, bah. Man. And thankfully, it never, made, it never made the cut. But I'm sure if I'd been out on that round, it would have. You know, the, 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 the way it's edited. This is what I mean but... about the pros. It just astounds me, right? And you as well. And we mentioned it to you while you were on there, especially you as a respected lecturer. I mean, you are putting your reputation on the line. Yeah. There is much more pressure in professional mastership than any of the others by far. What makes you, <laughs> others of your kind, what makes you do it? Is it because... The rewards are so great or the acknowledgement is so great or can you not resist the challenge because you're in danger of really damaging your reputation I, I, it's certainly it's certainly not the rewards because i mean there's, there's people born there and obviously most most folks just go back to work um for me i'm an absolute master chef nerd i love the show and i've watched it i've watched it right from the start and for me I didn't go on there to win. I didn't, you know, I know it sounds daft that you get into something like that and you don't go in to win. I went in, I wanted to be part of it. I wanted to see how it was done. I wanted to be right. part of that alumni that had done it, you know, and it just so happened I went on to win it. But it was, it was just to be part of it. And my only real objective was not to look daft on telly. That was it. And it was because I knew my kids were going to watch it. And that was it. I just wanted to be myself and do the best I could. But in my head, I knew I was going home at some point. I just wanted to make sure that I went home because someone else is better, not because I was rubbish. But there was a time, final 12, and final 12 was the point I'm standing and I'm really proud of myself. I know that even if I went home that day, that I could go back to, I could go back to college with my head held high and tell everyone that I had competed against the winner. And I remember you came up to us and we're with the cameras and all that are rolling. And we're side by side and you lean over and you say, you know the standard this year's rubbish, don't you? And I went, oh, really? He's, I says, how's that? He says, you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> true story. That's a true story. And I'm standing that there thinking, like me. <laughs> I'm standing there thinking, Greg must think I'm all right because he would have never said that to me <laughs> yeah, before. It's yeah. rubbish. But then the more I got to know you, I don't think it would have mattered. <laughs> I remember even you coming out, you coming out in that final twelve because obviously the, the, it's filmed over quite a long time to yeah, get to that yeah, stage. Yeah. And the first thing you said to everyone was, "I'm really surprised to see some of you here. <laughs> some <laughs> of you have made it because <laughs> you're not there at the critics. Oh, not there. No, no, no. You're not there I see the critics you all at the episode. beginning. I see you at uh, the beginning, and then I come back for the semis and the and the and the, uh, and the finals. But, uh, but, but again, yeah. for me, that was all part of that experience. It was all part of that that kind of master chef journey, and that's the kind of I'll probably remember the, those little interactions uh, more than, than the cooking can I, you, can I tell you a story about Marcus, right? Because me, me and Marcus have got closer and closer and friendlier and friendlier. Me and Monica have always been friends. But me and Marcus are now uh, equally as friendly. And they were both invited to my wedding, right? Now, you know Marcus as a... Well, you know him better now, but he's got a tough, tough reputation. Right? Yeah. And uh, you know, he, I, he, he I actually him. competed against Marcus as a kid. Marcus yeah. and I were in Marcus and I were in the Young Chef of the Year final together. There was six six finalists. It was me, Marcus, and Freddie. Uh, you know Freddie Forrester. 
Yeah. And I can't remember who else was there, but that was the year that uh, Marcus won and Freddie got second. They were both working in the aubergine. Right, so, right. Okay. So we, went, we, went, we went back, you know, 20 odd years before MasterChef and I never ever wanted to mention it. And I never mentioned it to Marcus until pretty close to the end, just in case he thought he remembered me as being really rubbish and thought <laughs> when they get rid of him. <laughs> well, but, I, I um, going over my wedding, and this was what's it, four years ago now, so uh, I opened an account with Odd. 2016, wasn't it? Your wedding was yeah. during the filming of our year. Is that right? Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Because all the crew, all the crew were like bus couches when they came back. On the stand crew. I did the uh, the sound guys and stuff. I can't remember the names, but a lot of the crew were. I think they were at your stag do. That's and, right. Uh, they, they came back, and I've got pictures of some of the crew sleeping under boxes <laughs> and <laughs> in Grave Time Manor. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. I re- that, they actually, but that they came up the other day, but they were saying out some of them had to go to work and how rough they were. Yeah. But uh, we, I opened an account with Odd Bins and I chose three whites and three reds because I'm, you know, I'm in my fifties. I don't need pots and pans. I don't need eider downs. I don't need <laughs> continental quilts and pillars. So I, I picked three whites and three reds and said to everybody, "Look, buy them." And then for four weeks, every Saturday, Odd Bins had turned up and they did it. We built up quite a cellar of three nice whites, three nice reds, and some people bought bottles, some people. Anyway, so Marcus said to me, I'm not buying those wines. They're rubbish. That's not the word he used, but I don't want to swear. He said, they're, they're rubbish. I'm not buying those wines. And I hope you're not serving those wines at your wedding. And I said, chef, please, don't be so rude. I said, look, you're going to get, well, I'm not, I might have to bring my own wines if that's a, and wouldn't stop going on about the wines, right? Day before my wedding, knock at my front door. And a guy in a van, he said, I've got a delivery here. He said, I've got, to, I need you to sign. And I have to tell you, it's from someone called Marcus Wary. And I looked down at the delivery note and I said to the guy, the delivery man, I went, mate, these are six really expensive bottles of white burgundy here. And he went, bottles? I've got cases. Six wow. cases. Six <laughs> cases. Yeah. That's but what every, a nice everybody, man he really Everybody is. loves Marcus. At my wedding, I said, I'd like to thank you all for your generosity, especially Marcus Waring. I can now open my own off license. And, uh, and I, I took two of the bottles, refrigerated them. And uh, after the speeches, I took them to his table. I went, oh, shit. Now you don't have to drink my rubbish. There you go. In your rubbish way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, do you have any input in the format of MasterChef? Because I know it kind of changes ever so slightly. Do you get None used to have a round table or no? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. I don't even know what we're doing until I turn up on the day. Absolutely right. <laughs> none, what none whatsoever. Um, I don't think Marcus and Monica do either. Only, only the skills tests. What the skills tests are going to be? They both don't like doing them, you know. The skills tests. Because what happens is they really want everybody to do their own skill. Because Marcus sets some, Monica sets the others, and yeah. they want they want all the chefs to succeed at their one. Yes. They 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 look at it as like a, a, a personal thing. And when they don't, they get disappointed. And when they start to get disappointed, the other one starts winding the other one up. Honestly, honestly. The 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 skills test before mine, I was number four, so I got Marcus's first one. And Monica's had the first three competitors and they'd done uh, artichokes, barigold. Mm, and the nice. first thing they said before I even did a thing, they were both raging. Um, chef, if you had, uh, if we'd given you artichokes, would you have been able to prep them? And I says, yeah. And they're shaking, shaking their heads at the, the last three didn't do well at all. But uh, I wonder, see, I, I sit there, right? And I wonder with the chefs that obviously lack knowledge, obviously lack knowledge. I wonder who it is who's told them that they're good enough to come on. Gary, yeah. this is this is a this is a premier cookery competition in the country. No, you know, if you haven't yeah. got the full range of skill sets, what are you doing on there? Why yeah. put yourself through it? Are you, are you just hoping? It'll be okay. I, I hope you get lucky. Yeah. Uh, to be to be fair though, and what I always say to anyone that's thinking about doing it, regardless of how well you do in the show, you're always treated really well, and they never portray you as being anything other than a you know a, a, a competent or decent cook. You know they never. It's not sensationalised that someone's messed up. You know they no, don't. Not. You know, and you and as chefs, we can see the skills test and go, that's been an absolute disaster, and then it'll go for comment. And uh, it's it's relatively kind, you know. Yeah. It's not a case of it's not a, it's not to rip MD apart. But um, obviously, guys, if MD's thinking about joining the, the recruitment process is now, so get the application filled in. Uh, where's my next? Do you spot 
Can you spot a potential winner on that first day, on that skills test? Can I quote the, 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 the great John Tarode here? It's his quote, right, to a journalist, and I loved it. So that very, very question. Can you spot the MasterChef winner in the first week? And he said, absolutely, yes, of course we can. We can tell you exactly who's going to win it in week one. And then by week two, we've thrown them out of the competition. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. You can spot talent. But the brilliant thing about MasterChef is it's all about how well you as chefs deliver. If you yeah. don't deliver, as good as you are, if you get to a point where we go, right, you've got to turn it on and you royally mess it up, there's nothing, nothing we can do. There's nothing You're can gone. save it. You're yeah. gone. And I'll tell you yeah. what, a lot of people say that's not fair. Someone's gone out through one bad dish and leading up to that point. And remember me saying at the start of this conversation, Gary, that it's a premier cookery competition, but it's foremost a television program, right? Yeah. All of those individual television programs have to work as individual programs. You have to be able to turn on the television, never seen it before, and that one one hour or 40 minutes has got to work as a standalone program. Yeah. This is the part of the success of MasterChef as a television program. Yeah, Not everybody is invested yeah. in every program. So let's say a Gary comes on, you. You've had three programs, you've been brilliant. The fourth program, you mess up, you go home, right? It seems unfair. However, to viewers that have never seen it before, it's the right result. It wouldn't make any sense at all for you to have the worst dish and stay in. Yeah. Yeah. That's why at every stage, if you this is why it, it's it's always the pressure is on if you don't deliver you're gone yeah i mean i was always i mean people commented on i was always kind of calm and collected on the show and it took me i reckon it took me a year to figure out why and before before that we do a lot of competitions at the college um we we you know loads and loads we do every sort of national competition and we do very well but we put a lot of effort and we put a lot of time and energy into to training the students and we, we kind of have a rule that you need 10 full practices before going to the competition. So there's a big investment. Wow. And you get one chance to win. So it's, you're always very nervous. On MasterChef, if there's 10 of you, the odds are in your favour because it's that one or two at the bottom end Brilliant. that go home. And if you, can size, if you can size up the crowd, you know, you can be quite relaxed and know, well, I think, you know, I think I can beat him or her. Or, you know, so I was always Gary, relaxed that, that way. Brilliant insight into MasterChef contestants that I never realised. Yeah, mate, that yeah. is a as brilliant. Long, insight. As long as you're not the worst, as long as you're yeah. not the worst, the odds are in your favour. If you can get by, see if you can get by that first day where half of all contestants go home. You know, you're, 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 the odds are in your favour to, to to do quite well. And then once brilliant. you get to that final twelve, each each episode that isn't isn't quite as uh, cutthroat as maybe the earlier ones. But that's how I kind of looked at. But it took me a long time to figure that out. So it did. Yeah, no, that's a brilliant insight. Well done, mate. That's a bit of psychology right there. When I go <laughs> back to Master Studio, because I'll be back in there Monday, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention that. That's yeah. that's that's a brilliant insight. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm I'm jumping over the questions a wee bit. What's your favourite round of Master Chef Professional? Do you have one? Yeah, it's not, it it's not round one. It's not skills test. It's, no. It's, my, my father-in-law has just started up the tractor. Can you hear me? I'm, I'm on an. I'm on, there, look, I'll show you. I'm on an. I'm on an old farm. Look. So he's just, could you see that he's, he's just starting. Now listen, I'm a boy from a council estate in South East London. I used to get nervous when I run out of concrete, and I now live on, a, live on an old farm. Um, so my favourite. Oh, actually, my favourite round, without a doubt, without a doubt. In fact, it's the highlight of the year. Is when we get to go out to the great and the good restaurants of Europe. Yeah. I mean, the, the that, you know, whether, whether I like them or not, whether I love them or just a little bit different, at least I've been there and I can say I've been there. It's, you know, for someone who, who's a foodie like me, that is an absolute privilege. The one I don't like, funny enough, is the one that you say you like watching the most, which is the skills test. Yeah. I, I just, that's the most nervous the chefs are ever going to be. And I feel for them. I absolutely it, feel for it, them. But it's set up to be nervous. Yeah. Because it's really the first time that the, the competitors meet the judges and see the studio. So yeah. all of that adds to it. And I think what a lot of people don't realise on the show is when, we, when we're walking into a restaurant or meeting, you know, a three Michelin star chef on camera, that's the first, it's the first time we've met them. 
So there's no cups of tea beforehand. There's no, you know, relaxing this or that. You know, you're walking in there, you're meeting a three Michelin star chef, you're getting led up the stairs and then you're cooking and it's all as it happens. And which I, I think the, is yeah. a great part of the show. It's real. You know, there's, it is a TV show, but it's as real as possible. You know, the reactions from us. Can I tell me? Can I, can I tell your your your, your uh, students there watching as well? Something clever we do in MasterChef now. I don't know whether you noticed or not. It's the production team working on the show. When we go into somebody else's kitchens, they put chef whites on, so that when they get caught accidentally on camera walking oh, through the back of shop, it doesn't look unusual. <laughs> oh, that's clever. That's clever. Yeah, that's really clever. Because <laughs> otherwise, you've got someone walking about with their jeans and. Jeans. I'll need to. I'll need to notice. I need to. Uh, I need to have a look. I'll probably recognise them. That's the same all guy. The, all the all the crew. Yeah, all the crew now have chef whites on. It's brilliant. So food's been a massive part of your life since you were 14, 15. You know, and again, you often get billed as a as a greengrocer. Mm. And yeah, do you do you like being called a greengrocer? Because I because I think the job that you've done in supplying some of the best restaurants in London. Yeah, it's it's not a greengrocer. Well, obviously you're you're in the, you're in the industry. Well, I don't know what you. I, I you know I I say it a little bit tongue in cheek because I, it conjures up images of a market stall. But yeah. the reality is, when I was 24 years old, I started that business. 24 years old. I'm now I'm now 57 this year, and I was supplying fruit and veg to the great and the good yeah. of London. I was running 15 vans out of Covent Garden Market every morning. So I was supplying the River Cafe, the Gavroche, Jamie, Gordon, Marco. Wow. All of those people were, were buying my fruit and veg because I cared about it and I was passionate about it. And more importantly, when it comes to the world of food, I started eating out in their restaurants. I was yeah. eating out three or four nights a week for 20 <laughs> years before I even went on to MasterChef. So that's where my food upbringing comes from. I'm very, very, you know, I've been very, very fortunate, but I fell in love with it. I didn't have good food growing up. Yeah. I was 24 when I started the fruit and veg business, and I was 25 before I, before I ate in a restaurant. That's quite late in life, you know, yeah. so it, it came to me as a real love and a, and a, and a real passion that's, that's never gone away. But that's where I learned about food, in the yeah. good restaurants. And probably what the students won't know is that relationship between chef and supplier is really strong. You know, some of my best friends are, are suppliers when I used to run restaurants, you know, and it's that relationship and it's that you're reliant on people. And you must have built up an incredible relationship with some of the most famous chefs that the UK has ever, ever seen. All of them. And they're on my phone. They're on my phone. You know, when I want advice on cooking things, I phone Sat Baines. I phone Michael Keynes, you know, <laughs> I phone them up on like, you know, how do, how do you cook the piece of far ground properly? How do you, you know, they're the, how, how do you properly make the orange sauce for the duck? You know, they're, they're, they're my pals. In fact, when MasterChef started, the BBC wanted to take me and John out because it was a big success. So they took us to the Ivy and thought it'd be like a big treat. And they yeah. turned up and the commissioner, um, what's her name? Anyway, it'll come to me. And uh, she said, Oh, am I the first? They said, no, Greg Wallace is in. They said, where is he? He said, he's in the kitchen. She said, what's he doing in there? You know, I don't know. So I come out, she went, what are you doing in there? I went, I supplied with fruit and veg. I was talking to the pastry section. I, I said, know the I said yeah, we're coming into the soft fruit season. She was like, what? And she had no idea, but that's what I, that's what I did. You know, you, yeah. you, if, you're, if you're a good supplier, you help the chefs build their menus around what's coming in. It's you the know, first that, protocol when any chef should be phoning the supplier first and saying, what's good? Because the supplier yeah. has got as much passion about their food as you have about yours. And they're I mean, not going to just give you the wrong advice to make a profit. They're going to tell you what's good. Because you want a lasting relationship. And then as yeah. stuff's going out of season, the price is going to go up. And then that's you're telling them, you're begging Quality. them to take it off the menu. You go, yeah, Chef, yeah, the, the cost of this is going to go flying up yeah. soon. You go, the Yorkshire rhubarb's over, mate. It's over. You're going to get a load of Dutch import and the, the import yeah. is going to put the price right up. You know, it's, 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 it's the end. Take it off, take it off, take it off. Or, right, there is now a glut of, and it's quality. Stick it on, stick yeah. it on, stick it on. You know? yeah. Yeah, I mean, right. it's not all going, I must have raspberries, they're on my menu. Change what the is, menu. Mate, change the menu. <laughs> Mother, Mother Nature is not going to bend to your menu. Um. I know you're a huge fan of Scotland. I know you, you come up here oh. a lot. 
Oh, um, and can I just I believe... say, for the record, and it, as a passionate Englishman, and I go up to Murrayfield with an England scarf, and you know I'm mates with Tom yeah. Kitchen as well, yeah. as well as you. You, as a passionate Englishman, it hurts me to say, you have the best produce in the world. England yeah. doesn't recognise it, but France does. How ridiculous yeah. is that? <laughs> you have America the best does as well. in the world. <laughs> For such a small place, you have the most beautiful produce. So you're show tonight, you're in Scotland, your big weekend. So I believe you're in Edinburgh, you're doing a, a free day in Edinburgh. I'm looking forward yeah. to seeing that. Yeah, and uh, uh, I, I listen, while I was up there, I, I went and had dinner at Tom's yeah. afterwards as well. At some kitchens and had the first of the season grouse. What a that's all that's always a, a big deal oh, for Tom. What the a glorious 12. Mate, what a beautiful, beautiful product. I mean, you look you look at you know, you, you look at look at Scotland, how much of it is still forest. And you look at the wild yep. when I was in Covent Garden Market in London, right? I used to buy wild mushrooms from Paris that had been picked in Scotland. I know. Now I, what is I bought that? scallops in Glasgow via runges that were yeah. landed in the West Coast, 40 miles from a restaurant, but they had a yeah. French label on, on them, Coquilles and Jack Echo says. Crazy. They'd gone from, they'd gone from crazy. Scotland to France and back again, right? Back again, that's yeah. Because that's because the people of France are used to better food than we are and that they know where it's coming from. But if you look at the seawater fish, the, 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 the quality of the farm fish, the freshwater fish and the crustacea and then your berries... And then yeah. the quality, I mean, you're, the, the, I've, I've also worked with, um, did a couple of days, not filming, I did, I did a couple of days up here with uh, sheep farmers. And yeah, like, the, the, the QMS. Standard, yeah, that's right. And the standard, yeah, yeah, the welfare on the beef and the welfare on the lamb is incredible compared to, yeah. to anywhere else. No, I, I, remember, I remember you doing that. And you do quite a lot of food festivals. I know you've done the Dundee Food Festival and stuff like that over the years. You like, you uh, like being it. on the road. Yeah, I like it. I've always enjoyed myself in Scotland. I, al I, al I always have. In this program um, that's on tonight, Channel 5, uh, they take me to uh, a single malt um, club. Distillery? No, not a distillery. No, oh, a club? Yeah, right. yeah. But they've got a huge collection. And I said to the guy there, look, come on. I said, how should I take it? Is it supposed to be straight up? Can I put a piece of ice in? Can I add a little bit of water? I don't want to make a mistake. I love my whiskies. How should I have it? Yeah. And he said, Mr. Wallace, you have it how you like it. That's the Great. rule. That's, that's the rule. And I was no, like, oh. No. oh. You, you can't go wrong. But let um, me tell you the story, right? So the boss, the executive producer, said to the director, so Greg's going to be tasting these whiskies. He said, yes. He said, when are we doing that? He said, tomorrow. He said, what time? He said, oh, around midday. He went, and then you have planned the rest of the day for him to be filming? He went, yeah. <laughs> he went, you're going to let Greg taste whiskeys for about an hour and a half. He and said, go, move it to the end of the day. <laughs> I'm going to watch it and find out if they did. He said, "There's no move it to, that's got to be the last thing we film because you're not going to get anything out of Greg after that. <laughs> that would be a mess. Um, it, it's funny, I was looking on uh, Sky Q Box and uh, I, 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 I shouted in the box, Greg Wallace. And just now, right now, today, there's 14 different shows available wow. of yours on eight different channels on wow. Sky. And that's not counting Netflix or anything else. My question is, how wow. do you get the time? How do you get the time? How do you squeeze it all in? I've had to start giving things up. I've now given up Eat Well for Less. Oh, that's a, a great show. Yeah. Yeah, you, you you can't you can't do it all. Um, I I am just willing to work every day. One of my I'm, favorites is inside the factory because I yeah. really love seeing behind the scenes. And That's, again, when when it looks as though you really enjoy that show, you're there's, you're like a little kid in a sweetie shop on in half of those factories, and it's it's brilliant to watch. I'm getting criticised now by some journalists for being too enthusiastic. Can you believe that? <laughs> I mean, what I might do is put a tie on, right, a suit and tie, and try and do it like an old-fashioned BBC presenter and see if they like that. I'll, we'll give it a go now in front of you and your students. And here we are, you see, there are 30,000 yogurts passing my eyes at roughly 47 miles per hour. If I speak to the gentleman next to me and ask him how many he produces, I think you'll find he'll tell you that's up to 12 tonnes a day. Quite remarkable. <laughs> when you think about it. Or you can have me going, wow, look at them yogurts. <laughs> and that's it. I, I know which one I'd prefer. 
No, like, likewise, likewise. <laughs> so your your new show, The Big Weekend's Away, um, again, it's, it's brilliant. And again, totally natural, totally uh, total Greg Wallace style. Are you are you thinking that this might be another new avenue for you in terms of being the next uh, Wicker or Michael Palin? No. Is that something you'd fancy? Because again, no. I know you love the, the yeah. travel. Yeah, we, we all do, Gary. Mate, we all do. It's the nicer end of telly. It's like, it's just fabulous. It's every day another adventure. You know, you, 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 you're out. I, I love, listen, MasterChef's my favourite, all right? It really is. But these travel shows are just, just phenomenal. And in terms of food, do you know what's funny? I, now I've done this show, my opinion on countries' cuisine is changing. I now judge a country's um, food culture on how good its bottom end is. And we yeah. still struggle in Britain. In Britain, we have the best high end. We're getting good mid range. We have brilliant, brilliant, mid, brilliant high end, as, be, as, as good as anywhere else in the world. Mid range, we're getting better and better. But our cheapest food is still not brilliant. That's and rubbish, when you look yeah. at Italy, Spain, and my favorite ever, you wait till this comes out, Istanbul. If you get, have you ever been, Gary? No, I've never, no, I've not been. Mate, if you get the opportunity, and what makes it brilliant out there, are, there are specialist food shops. And when I say specialist, I mean it. The baklava shop was 200 years old and refused to sell anything else but baklava. The Turkish That's delight incredible. shop, over 100 different flavours, refused to sell anything else <clears throat> other than... I found one corner shop. Well, I say shop. It wasn't a corner shop like we have a corner site with benches outside and benches inside. And all it sold was lamb's intestines. I went back there three times. Uh, honestly, really? two guys with a huge griddle just constantly cooking up lamb's intestines in different ways. There was one place that only did pickled and salted vegetables. They're, they are specialists mm -hmm. and they stick. I think, I think we, we try and be all things to all people in business, so don't we? We've got this kind of fear that no one will like having less choice. But I think this whole lockdown, I think you'll see a difference in restaurants you know, where chefs are, are actually selling what they want to sell, you know, and, and, and cutting back because, you know, the, the larger menus and all that choice just costs money and hours and, you know, so hopefully hopefully there will well, be a, that, a change. Meant, the, the streets of Istanbul is that people went out in the evening, they might have already had their dinner, but they were going out to buy something that was far better than they could ever do at home. Yeah. Because their, their grandparents had been buying it from the same shop. they it. it it's the cheaper food. It's a, it's a, it's a pro, proper culture, and we don't really have a food culture as yet. No. You know, if, if, you, know, if you think about fine dining, I mean, you, you often hear about the, the Rue brothers talking about having to go to the chemist to buy olive oil for the restaurant and stuff like that. So our food culture, we'll get great produce, but we don't seem to have that kind of uh, ingrained culture of food yet. And I think it'll, it's it's definitely cultural change that, that we need and it will take a while. Yeah, but but we need we need to have better cheap food. Like I go all over yeah. Europe. My wife, for those of you who don't know, is Italian, right? Yeah. I drive, I drive from my house in Kent to Italy when we can, right? It takes us three or three days. And you go through France, you go into Italy, you stop at the motorway service stations. And as far as I can tell out there, no one anywhere has stuck a sandwich in a fridge. Why, oh why? Have we got, and they've just got, there they got breads, they got cheeses, they got meats, you pelt them what, what you want, like a posher subway, right? So why have we got them in fridge? And as far as I can tell in Italy, no one's dying of warm sandwich disease. So why <laughs> have we got them in fridges? I just, it's just, it's just crap food. We deserve better. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, are you working on any other books? I know you had your, uh, you, you, you launched your Italian book. Uh, 19, I love 19th. that. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Again, um, great book. I, there's, there's, there's a strong rumour, because I've got, I'm, I'm building a good relationship with Channel 5, that I might be able to do my first ever cookery show so that people can see me cook. Actually, Gary, if we haven't written it yet, if we're allowed guests, you can, you please come and I'll help hold me. You, I'll hold you to that. Yeah, That'd be good. Uh, but we but I want to do it. I want to do it around vegetarian cooking. Not because, not because I'm a vegetarian. I'm not. Uh, but because I was a green grocer, I love vegetables so much. And also, I think there's lots of people like me that aren't ready yet to give up meat, but 
want to eat a little bit less and a little bit more veg. So yeah. that, that's we're, the way we're I'm going. We're pretty bad at cooking veg, aren't we? We're pretty bad. Well, if you do uh, that, there'll probably be a book to go with it. Yeah, yeah. so that's what I'd like to do, introduce more. You're, so you're, you're so the first time you see me cooking, it'll be, it'll be fruit and veg. Isn't that? Brilliant. Amazing. Amazing. And again, you've, you've, uh, you keep, how, what's it like being a new dad? Again, those, those <laughs> who don't follow you on social media, uh, I know the answer to this already, but what's it like? Well, I'm 56 years old. And I've got a baby who'll be two at the end of April and he, his name is Sid. And um, I live here with my wife, obviously. My, my daughter, Libby, who you've never met, um, she's grown up as well. And my wife's Italian parents, Massimo and, and, Re and Rina. And not because of lockdown. This is like an Italian way. They all moved into this this house we bought in, in the countryside. So there's lots of help with the baby boy. Lots yeah, I mean, and lots of help. Because at my that, age, it, it would have been hard work. It's knackering. <laughs> that, yeah. that last night we did together in, in uh, Waitrose, oh you my announced God. for the what? first time. To, you announced the first... You announced oh, is that right? That night, you you said you may or may have... Because you never had... An, I think he was about two or three weeks old, but I don't think you had uh, released it to the press or anything. That's right. That's uh, right. No. I hadn't. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Gary, well done. I don't remember much of that night because it, it was a crazy there was night. A, there was a bit of wine involved. What and a brilliant I, night that was. Absolutely I think I was flying out to Miami or something the very next morning. So it was a crazy, uh, crazy time. But this, this, this baby boy will, will cook and will cook really well. I mean, you can... You can see because it's an Italian family. It's a it's a kitchen family, so he he will just he he will cook, no doubt about it, because the whole family cooks. So yeah, he's an absolute joy. But it is tiring. But we're not alone here. We got yeah. we got Nonna and Grandpa here to to help. Good, yeah. good support. Mm. And the last last couple of years, you've been on a a fitness trend. Uh, you, you introduced you as a, as a fitness guru, which, to be fair, isn't isn't wrong. You know, you're you're looking better than ever. Um, so you've got a, a site that can help people follow your example called Show Me Fit. You, can you tell the the, the guys? Yeah, on the line yeah. About that? Um, well, I, I've lost <clears throat> four and a half stone. I'm, I'm now twelve stone. I, Where did I was... you lose four and a half stone from? I've heard this before. Where did you have four and a half stone to lose? I never Mate, thought you were you, you weren't big. No, but you didn't know me at my biggest. Right. You know, at my biggest, I was really, I mean, go back and look at the, some of the old MasterChef pictures. I'm huge, absolutely huge. Um, so I'm four and a half stone lighter. And I just did that for me, right? And I got fitter and I got leaner and I got stronger and I, I paid more attention to what I was eating and drinking. And what was happening was the pre Lou Plank, you know Lou Plank, yeah. PR. She would set up lots of press interviews for MasterChef when the MasterChef series were coming out. And the journalists kept asking me about my weight loss. And MasterChef was saying, can you stop hijacking the interviews we're setting up by talking about your weight? And I said, well, I'm not doing it. Yeah, They're asking doing the question. it. And yeah. that's when I realized there was an interest. So during the first lockdown, I just built a subscription website that's seven pounds a month. And I stacked it full of over 200 easy to do healthy recipes. I've got a gym instructor on there. I put a nutritionist on there. And I also put a psychologist on there. Wow. And we all write blogs all the time. And we have a Facebook group and a support group. And they can ask us email. And I'm helping, I would say, hundreds of people. There's nearly 2,000 people on that site. Wow. And we are helping you're, hundreds of people. You're now starting to people. see kind of before and after pictures coming through now. Obviously, it's... Well, it's been about 10 months, so yeah. you're, you're getting to see people showing off their, uh, their new bods. Well, if you want to go on there, you don't have to, you don't have to pay to be on there. there. There's some free pages, and you can see some of the before and after pictures already. Yeah. No, it's on, incredible. On yeah, yeah, so I expect that business to grow. There's now a, a, a marketing and, uh, and a creative company called Home who are based in Yorkshire. They've now come in to take they said we really like what you're doing so i've done a deal with them they're building a brand new website they've started to market it and i think we're, we're growing from there my daughter's just walking past her name's libby she actually runs the company she's 24 yeah. years old she, we have been in touch you she she um she stuck at a box thing on at christmas and she stuck that on your instagram thanks very much no 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 <laughs> pleasure yeah so yes we'll get 
We've got a stack oh, of questions it. coming in from the, the students. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. It'll be a kind of quick fire. Are you still a yeah. big fan of all things chocolate? Yeah, I can't resist a bit of chocolate, but it's a treat for me now. I don't eat it every day like I used to, yeah. So there, okay. there you are. Here's a cracking question. It's from Kevin. Uh, what is the most intriguing thing you've ever seen inside a factory? What's Kevin, the thing that you went... There's two things, one of which was uh, Nescafe, freeze-dried coffee, that they actually make an enormous pot of coffee that's about 100 foot high. No, 30 foot high. They make enormous pots of coffee and then they drain the liquid out of it. Then they free, then they freeze dry what's left. So what we have basically, and they take the aroma off and they stick it back in the bottle in the in the jar afters. What we're basically <laughs> drinking is secondhand coffee. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And the other one, can I tell you a moment? Have you seen the film? Oh, what's it? The uh, Keanu Reeves, when we're all living in a computer world. What's that called? Yeah, Matrix. The Matrix. You know yeah. the bit where he wakes up and he looks around and he realises all the humans are in pods? I had this moment at Walker's Crisps, right, where there were these, they were, they were about eight feet high and they were like metal pineapples and each, there were metal cups hanging off it and the crisps cascade down it and each metal cup catches about 30 grams and then goes, donk, 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 yeah. donk, and fills up the crisps, right? Yeah. And there was one machine in front of me and it had about 30 cups in it or maybe 20 cups going, donk, 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 as the crisps came down, right? And I said to the guy, so where do you store the crisps? He went, oh, no, we don't store them. He said, as soon as we fill up the lorry, we send them out. I said, so basically, we the, the, we are eating crisps as fast as you're making them. He went, yeah. And I had that Keanu Reeves way. <laughs> so I was only looking at cheese and onion, right? And I was looking at this one machine. And as I looked up, there were literally about 30 long and about 15 wide in this enormous hall. And I thought that is the speed with which. So there were hundreds of bags filling up every second, and that is the speed that we were only eating Walker's cheese and onion. That just blew my mind. <laughs> I just couldn't. I just couldn't comprehend the the that much consumption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh Absolutely incredible. Got a question in here from Carol. Uh, where would you recommend a first-time visitor to Italy to go? Right for for the food, or or we don't know. We can't get back to it. Right. Yeah, just for the for the for the for that Italian experience. Right, 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 right. Okay, you 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 want to hit you want to hit the cities, all right? You want to hit. Don't 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 go for for God's sake. Don't go to Pisa. It's got the leading town. That's all it's got. That, that's all it's got. Don't go anywhere near it. Uh, the Tuscan town, you know, go to Rome. Don't do Venice. Don't do Venice. Really, really expensive. Worst food in Italy. Uh, do Rome or do Florence, all right, if you've never, ever been before. Now, here's my tip. Before you go, learn the Italian words for the foods you like. All right? Learn the aqua is water. Uh, vino rossa, vino rose. Vino Bianco, now pesce for fish, pollo for chicken, manzo for beef, right? Bistecca for a steak. Now you don't have to eat anywhere with an English menu. Now you can eat where the locals eat. Learn the words of the foods that you want to eat. And here's another tip in Italy, because if the food of Italy is it's probably my favorite in the world. If you are paying more than 20 pounds for a main course, you are in the wrong place. If you are paying more than 20 pounds for a bottle of wine, you are in the wrong place. The beauty of Italy is it's a simple food. And this is why I like the difference between Britain, right, and uh, between Britain and Italy. In Britain, if we have an alleyway, we put dustbins in it. In Italy, if there's an alleyway, they stick a restaurant in it. <laughs> No, I, I, love it. I, I love it. I love it. The food's, the food's just incredible. Oh, I once did a, a culinary tour with Andrew Fairley. Uh, we, we went round and seen the palm ham and the oil, and uh, it was an amazing, an amazing, uh, an amazing trip. There's a, there's a two questions here, very similar. Uh, one from Julie and one from Paul, uh, and is what inspires you to love food, and what is the best dish or the most memorable dish you've ever eaten? What was the first question? Because we had a glimpse. Plus, what, what, what inspires your love for food? Uh, food, the appreciation of good food and restaurant food came to me quite late in life. So it, it, it's, it's what inspires me. Uh, food is the great leveller. It's something we all want to breathe. 
we all want to be loved by someone and we all want to eat. It doesn't matter what it is. And I don't believe there is such a thing as a food lover. If someone's not a food lover, I'll show you a corpse. I believe some <laughs> people have more knowledge of foods, maybe uh, access to finer foods, but everybody I've ever met is a food lover. Even people that eat burgers all day long can tell you which burgers they like more than others. It's one of those great levelers. We all eat. Uh, that's what inspires me. What the world eats is a never-ending story. And the best dishes I've eaten on MasterChef, they're the classics. You know, they're, they're, they're the classics. As innovative as people get, I can wow at them. But it's the classics. It's things like a pear bel -Elen. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's Gary, forgive me if I get this wrong. You're the professional. But, you know, you take a pear, you poach it in something like sauterne, which is maybe the best flavoured thing the world has ever seen. You make, uh, you make a Chantilly cream. You make a, a chocolate ganache. Mate, honestly, if you don't want to eat it, take it home and snog it. I mean, it's just <laughs> that, that classic French technique that I think is just stunning. I remember some of the best reactions I've ever got from from my dishes with some of the simplest stuff in my opinion that I'd ever done in the show. There was a round when we did um it was a dish of love and I made a kind of layered chocolate gato kind of spread. Oh. And and I got I got I had to cook again and uh, it was a vegetarian challenge and I made lemon tart and you just went bananas for it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> strangely enough again it was your round it was a vegetarian round obviously harkening back to your right, 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 days at right. the market but I uh, and it's horrible going back in as you can probably imagine and and your brain's empty so you revert back to your kind of classics and it was a uh, lemon tart I, I isn't that them. interesting I said it's the old fashioned classics yeah. did it? and it was and you bring up an old fashioned classic that got you through the next round yeah, yeah you've yeah. got to remember everybody it's very difficult for me I haven't got the greatest memory anyway and I, I, I filmed three series of MasterChef a year. You can imagine how many dishes. I mean, I'm tasting up to eight dishes a day. Eight dishes yeah. a day, nine months of the year, 17 you become, years. <laughs> 17 years. You become a, a, bit, a bit. Here's a, here's a rugby question. What do you think England's chances are of winning the Six Nations? And when Very you slim. Were you upset when Scotland took home the Calcutta Cup? That's no, a, a, I wasn't. A message I, from I, Matthew. No, I wasn't upset. I, I, I wasn't upset upset I'm, I'm a big rugby fan for people that don't know I'm, I'm actually I've got two rugby coaching qualifications as well I played hooker in my in my younger years I, I just love the rugby experience I probably had the best night in Edinburgh I'd had um, when Scotland beat England when they trounced England about four <laughs> years ago me and yeah. my son we just had the best night ever because Edinburgh was rocking I should imagine yeah. Scotland was rocking it's a and show. so it's the experience I want I'm, I'm not as now, let me talk to you, 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 you Scotsman here about this, right? I know that you all love to hate England, and that's fair enough, right? I, I can accept that. I don't think that's particularly true, but... Well, we'll all get, right, all yeah. right. But let I me ask you this. True. I don't let, think let that's the consensus. But. If England were playing Australia, then the Scots fans would be cheering for Australia, right? If Scotland yeah. were playing Australia, who do you think the England fans would be cheering for? It's Scotland. Scotland because he's it's, here yeah, for Australia. Yeah, and, and I've talked to loads, <laughs> loads of Scots and Irish and Welsh supporters who refuse to believe that. We don't feel the same way about you as you feel about us. But rugby is a is a is a wonderful thing, and you know I love it a great deal. I go home and away. My boy's twenty six years old. He's a good rugby player. That's what we do together, and I miss it a great deal. Murrayfield is a fine, fine stadium, and uh, you played the Scots. Scots played really, really well against England. Although saying that, they are a little underpowered at the moment, I think, England. They're, 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 they're off the pace. And um, you should imagine Scotland were disappointed the next week being, being beaten by, by Wales. That's the thing. It must be infuriating being a Scotland rugby fan. You know, you, you're watching some world-class stuff followed next week by like, oh, what is happening? It's, it, it's just the Scottish way in it. The football's the same. The football's the same. They take you so close. Um, I've got a question here from Bruce. Uh, with a name like Wallace, have you got any Scottish roots? Yeah. Where does the Wallace yeah. come from? W-A-L-L-A-C-E. My grandfather's family uh, came to England looking for work, I think, uh, turn of the century and, uh, and, and stayed. Um, the, the Blue Lion, you see, of Millwall, which was the football team I was brought up with, that's a Blue Lion. That's a Scottish Lion. That's yeah. Scottish steel workers who, who made that uh, over East London. It's quite, a, it's quite a tough London. club, isn't it, Millwall? It's got that kind of reputation. Yeah. And 
Yeah, you, you you're, Scottish you're fans, a, a big fan. You, you'd feel at home. You'd feel at home there. You'd, you'd understand. No, I think there is a kinship with with Bill Wall. It's that it's one of those kind of kind of hearty. Yeah, but hearty it, it, came, it came out. It came. It, it was a club for Scottish steel workers who wanted a football team. Oh, that's is that how, right? Is that's that right? That yeah. That's where that's where the blue that's where the blue lion is. Yeah, that's 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 yeah. the blue lion. That's the like eighteen eighty seven or something. Yeah. So, so um, no. So, but we we do have a, a Scottish a Scottish heritage. Yeah, we've got. Uh, well, you can see me if you watch this Channel Five thing tonight. Uh, Looking, tracking back my Scottish ancestry, and even managing to wear a kilt. Oh, right. I even have a go. I even have a go playing the bagpipes, crying out there. Oh, that's hard. There. It's easier to wear a kilt than play the pipes. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you enjoy eating when you're away from the cameras? That's from uh, Nicola. Well, what? my fam, my wife's family are Italian. I just love the simple food of Italy. I just absolutely just love it. I mean, they they knock up fresh pasta in about ten minutes. You know, you, you can have papadelli and, and, and you can have a ragu on the on the go here most of the time. It's just the simple, simple, simple foods. Like a white bean soup with a garlic, like with a garlic toasted base. Like they, they they garlic the toast and they put it in the bottom of the soup and they pour the soup over the and it's just simple foods that I've, I've learned so much. I mean, my father in law is here, Massimo, he had a pretty poor Italian rural upbringing. So he doesn't barbecue because it's something fun to do at the week. He just barbecues because that's he had no cook when, he, cook. <laughs> when <laughs> he was a kid. And honestly, his rabbit, mate, with olives and olive oil, unbelievable. And yet, um, uh, Cornelio. In Italian, his 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 rabbit is is uh, is superb. Um, yeah, so it's just the the simple thing. You know, my wife will will just get loads of chicken pieces in a tray, a little bit of stock, a little bit of wine, plenty of salt over the top. That's it. Just sticks it in the oven with a load of onions, and it's just great big anchor bread. I mean, it's just it's simple food. Uh, when you were working in the fruit and veg business, did you have a favourite season? Yeah, spring, mate. Spring. Your, your job changes yeah, yeah, so yeah, much yeah. as the weather changes. Spring, mate, that's striking oil for a greengrocer. You chefs, right? On your menus is going to go peas, going to go broad beans, going to go asparagus. We're going to get the start of the soft fruit. You're going to have the wild garlic. We start to make a lot of money in the spring. In the winter, you know, it doesn't matter how many tons of turnips you sell a chef, you ain't going to make any money out of it. It's not a high value item. The sun comes out, the spring comes, all of a sudden all that beautiful produce is 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 on the menus, you know, and that that is it. You start to make, and they're, and they're money items. Asparagus is a is a luxury item, and it's something that you as chefs can sell as a plate on its own. Yeah, you know that, that a, that's it's a it. Premium, yeah, yeah. So and for Britain's me, growing more and more asparagus. So they yeah. are, I mean, the, 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 there's a lot more a lot more uh, British asparagus, and the flavour is just night and day. I think compared to what but, you normally get. And the the reason it's so expensive is you cannot machine harvest it. I don't know whether you know, but I also had a farm business where we grew fruit and veg. And, a, and asparagus, every spear takes up about that much ground. Yeah, I've, every single I've actually, spear. I've actually picked it. I did some filming. I was picking some asparagus yeah. uh, just out by Glasgow Airport. We've got a there big asparagus go. farm. It's, you uh, be- and, and you have to pick it every day. So you can go yeah. past one day, then come back the next and, and you're to and pick again. If you, if, you get, if you get asparagus for three years, then you won't get any for two years after that. So nearly half the time. Can I tell you my uh, my, my favourite Glasgow story? Right? Well, not my favourite, one of my Glasgow stories. I was up here because I, I was um, we used to do the BBC Good Food Show up here, right? Yeah. So I was I was queuing up to get some cornflakes the first time I was up here about 15 years ago. And a little Glaswegian fella ran past me and he went, you! Excuse my accent. You! <laughs> I, looked around him. I was like, what? He went, you got three minutes! <laughs> uh, Brilliant. I always thought your sense of humour was very Scottish. It's very dry and very kind of uh, really quick. You know, I, I remember I was I was out shopping again. It was just after kind of Master Chef. You know, it's madness when that when it just just can, when it just finishes. And I was in Costco, and some some guy shouted over, "Gary!" I was like, "All right," and you know, I was you know thumbs up. He says, "How long will this take to cook?" <laughs> so I'm like a pu- public servant, you know. But uh, oh, some yeah. other some other oh, questions oh, here. Oh, so, go on, go on. Yeah, go uh, on. You don't have to answer this one, but it's it's obviously a big talking point from last year. Why was the fourth contestant cut out of MasterChef? Can't tell you. Pass. Pass. I can't, I can't um, tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows, but are you? So you'd be yeah, in trouble I, if I, they I, found I, out. I know. I, obviously, I know, but I can't do. No, I'm interested I, I, to know. I'm interested to know the theories. 
Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I know I've got a theory that I don't share because I've been all behind right. the scenes and, right, and kind of came, right. but we'll leave that. Um, a question from Nathan. Have you met Gordon Ramsay? Yeah, loads of times. Gordon is an absolute charming man. Yeah, 100%. A charming, yeah, charming man. Family man, charming man. You know, that angry persona on the television is not him. All right, that's, that's the team. And also, you cannot argue with three Michelin stars. There is no arguing with the quality of that chef. That is, that is it. I mean, Oscar, Gordon Ramsay, Royal Hospital Road is, is a phenomenon. And although he's not there all the time, that's definitely got him all over, all the way through. Yeah. I think... Again, what he's done, and you can see that from his new show, the the game show that he's got, he is proper telly, isn't he? I mean, he's just he's just infectious to watch, and he's found himself a niche and a brand. And I, I love it. I love watching uh, Gordon on TV. You know, again, it's just that little bit of escapism. And yeah, again, he, under, he understands a formula as well. You were talking about MasterChef being, if you watch one episode, it's got to be entertaining, and it's got to have a beginning, middle, and end. He has found with all his shows... There's, you know, you can you can watch, you know, his kitchen nightmares from ten years ago, and then yeah. a brand new one, and you wouldn't really notice the difference other than his haircut. And yeah, it's very very clever. He's and a, he's, he's made a guy. I've done a couple of things. He's with made him. a lot of money in the states. Oh yeah. my word, he's made. A Have you ever money. tried to break into the states? Is, no, is that something. Oh mate, I'd love to. The money out there is unbelievable. I do yeah. more in the states than I do here. I've had do more you? gigs. I've had more gigs in New York than I've had in Glasgow. And do they pay more money? Nah, it's always voluntary. I always do it for the love oh, of it. Oh, really? I do it for yeah, Scotland. Yeah, volunteer I do a lot work, of kind of... Volunteer work, but wouldn't do it if you paid me. <laughs> um, there's a lot of eat well for less questions and, and is there a new series and stuff, but you've already said that... I've resigned um, from it, yeah. I know, you've, you've, you've yeah, not there. Yeah. If, they're looking for a, if they're looking for a lookalike, All put right, my name man. in, give them All a right. shout. Um, do you remember the call when you, when you got the call to be the judge on MasterChef? Yeah, I went for an interview with a lady called Karen Ross, who was the producer at the time. But by the time you got there, the exec was David Ambler, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. David, David Ambler used to be Karen Ross's right hand man. Um, Karen Ross, my agent said, get down to a company called Shine, um, smart new production company. They're making a food show. They want to meet you. They don't know what it is. And I met Karen Ross, and there was a young woman at the end of the table, and she put a camera up and started filming me. And Karen Ross said, tell me about food. I said, anything? She said, anything you like. And I spoke for 45 minutes without taking a break. She said, come outside because she smoked and uh, she lit a fag and she went, uh, right, I've got a job for you. I'm remaking MasterChef. I was like, what? She went, I'm remaking MasterChef. Oh, you didn't even know it was MasterChef. She went, we start in two weeks time. It's going to be three months of filming. Can you do it? I was like, yeah, that was it. I said, changing. She, she said, I've got a chef who, she said, I've got a chef judge. I want a judge who's not a chef. I said, who's the chef? I mean, he's an Australian bloke. You probably won't know him. His name's John Turow. Do you know him? I said, he's been buying fruit and veg off of me for the last 10 years. And that was it. That was it. But, I think, but again, when you look at John's story as well, I mean, John is a, is a proper chef. You know, he's, he's, you know, he's transformed into being this mega, mega celebrity. Um, so he's but a, he's but another... the professional one you did, that came along about a year, 18 months later. Yeah. And one then, of my friends was actually the very one. first one. Was he? He was in the very first episode. He, he did a, he did an episode, and again the format and stuff was a bit different, but but it's just grown and grown. It's totally infectious. And again, with the, it was great. With the great Michelle Rue Junior, who I love, yeah. I love the Gavroche. I love the Gavroche. But it was yeah. great this year that he's managed to get the show done because I think yeah. for a lot of a lot of chefs, it was a kind of highlight of the year to be able to escape and watch, and it, and it produced some incredible characters, didn't it? I mean, oh, Nantosh. Santosh is made for life now, isn't he? I mean, he's he's like king in Nepal. You know, Mate, he's doing he's doing he TED brilliant? talks. Oh, amazing! I mean, the, the whole country just just fell in love. My favorite quote of his, my favorite quote of his. We said, Santosh, you're really up against it here. You, you're going to get it done. He said, uh, oh, and I think Marcus or Monica said, "Well, you better pray." He went. Well, there's lots of gods up there. Maybe one of them will help me. <laughs> and one of them will help me, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's plenty of gods. But again, we've got him lined up for one of these as well. I think you Brilliant. Be, uh, Give him my warmest regards because he's a lovely man. So we're going to have to... I know we've only got you for an hour, so we just have to try and wind this up. Um, I'm trying to look at the rest... diary and see what I've got next. What have I got coming up next? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you late? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we're all right. We can carry on going another five minutes or so. 
No worries. Favourite restaurant in Scotland? The kitchen. Kitchen. Yeah. The kitchen. It's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, a strong the, contender. Without doubt. Um, compared to the other judges, you always seem more relaxed in helping others. Again, we kind of spoke about that, you know, with your kind of your, your whole whole lifestyle. But even watching you guys off camera, there seems to be a really strong bond between you, Marcus, and Monica. You know, and we, yeah, I said both of those guys were at my wedding. I'm, I'm very fond of, of the of the pair of them. They're great. And Gary, you'll you'll uh, you'll bear witness to this. Marcus and Monica may look scary at the start, but as you go through the competition, you get to know them, and they're yeah. good people, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I'm still. I mean, I had a conversation with Monica when we were in Norway, and uh, we were in, remember that kind of final night, but but we had the barbecue where Marcus cooked cooked everybody food. Yeah. And, um, there was kind of there was these uh, block of toilets in the middle of the forest, and it was really dark. So I walked Monica just to escort her, make sure she was okay, and we had a chat. And I said to Monica, I said, Monica, the reality is you're the nicest out of them all as a human being. You're really sweet, really gentle. But all, as soon as those cameras go on, you're an absolute bitch. Yeah. And she yeah. says, don't tell anyone. <laughs> she makes a lot of money from being the, the bitch. <laughs> but um, but Monica, is, Monica is scary. And I've done a couple of things with both of them. I did the one show and stuff like that the year after. And and even just going back into both their companies, you know, and they're giving you a hug and everything else, but it's still quite intimidating, you know. And the reality is I've been cooking longer than Monica. You know, wow. I'm, I'm older than Monica, so. <laughs> but, um, but it was good fun. I've just got two more questions for you so you can Go get ahead. to your next Go appointment. Ahead. So what advice would you give to any students or staff at the college if they wanted to, to go on MasterChef? Oh, MasterChef, I thought you were going to get career advice first. Get in the best kitchen or the best restaurant you can. Just knock on the door, get in there. Just get in there and learn from the best people. There you go. Um, MasterChef, make sure you put your homework in. It's no good going in there with a repertoire of three or four good dishes. You need much more than that. And you need to really hone your skills. Don't leave holes in your knowledge. Don't work on the things that you're already good at. Work on the things that you know where your weaknesses are so that you're a decent all-rounder. Don't ignore the pastry. There you go. <laughs> and what's next for you that you can tell us about? Um, I think we're going to see my first ever cookery show on television. You're actually going to see me cook. But I think this show me fit is going to grow and grow and grow and become a bigger and bigger part of my life. I've, I've really enjoyed helping people losing weight and I really want to do that. Um, I, I might, I'm, I'm, going, I'm talking to a psychologist trying to learn more and more about the psychology of why we eat, why we eat the wrong things. I think that's absolute key. It's been a game changer for me in my life. And I've re now I've realised I can help other people as well. That's it. I've got the bit between my teeth. So yeah, yeah. I expect that to become a bigger and bigger part of my life. No, amazing. Greg, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been, a, we could talk all day, I'm sure. We need to get a, we need to get a wee night out. But uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm sure the students uh, and staff that are watching on have enjoyed uh, learning and listening and, and just seen what can be achieved with a bit of hard work. You know, you, you, you don't forget where you've come from, but you've got where you are right now because you have grafted. And I think it's important that it's nothing to do with luck. It's all to do with working hard and and uh, being the best that you can. So well, thank you okay, for that's sharing exactly that. It, mate. It's always a pleasure. I've got nothing but, but uh, respect and affection for you, son. You're a great bloke and a great ambassador for, for, for Scottish culinary art. But one thing I would say to anybody out there, I don't know whether you're young, I'm guessing you're young, is uh, one bit of advice I would say is do every single task as well as you can always because you never know who's watching and you don't know where the opportunity is going to lie. Yeah. The opportunity might come along the day you're deciding to not do it very well and it will pass you by. Just if you're going to do it, do it as best as you can do it. You never know who's watching. That's how I got on telly. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Bless you, mate. Brilliant. Lovely to see Hello, you. Chef. Hopefully see you soon. See you soon.